Hello, hello, Crack Attack here, and today we're going to be doing a relic guide and tier list for Dota Auto Chess. So, generally, how this video is going to go is I'm going to go through each relic individually, give a brief description on it, how and when you should use this relic, and then place it into a tier list for whether you should pick it at round 10 or not. So the reason why I selected round 10 in particular is because it's the most important round in the game as the relic you choose there sets you up for the rest of the game and can determine whether you finish in top 4 or bottom 4 as it has a huge impact on your economy and how fast you can put your composition together before anyone else. So I decided against doing round 20 and 30 right now as it would be a complete information overload packed into one video but if there's enough interest, maybe I could do another video down the line for those two. But for now, we're going to focus on each relic, description, when you should use it, and what tier it will fit in from S rank to C rank for round 10. So without stalling any further, let's get right into our relic, tier list and guide. So first up, we're going to start with Great Vault. So the way Great Vault works is that for every 10 gold you save past 40 gold, you will generate another 2 gold per turn. So, in my opinion, this is actually the best relic in the game right now to pick at round 10, so I'm going to slot this bad boy right into S tier, as it can literally be used in every single situation at round 10, and will most of the time generate more value than any other relic at this point in the game. So, Great Vault is very straightforward to use. Literally, just don't spend any gold and just save it all the way to level 80. Just don't do anything. Super simple. Just don't touch your economy. Just save to 80 before you do anything else going forward. And the great thing about this is that there's no risk of losing value between rounds like some of the other relics might have like Sin Reaper and Chiascuro. As once you reach 80 gold, you'll be generating more gold than any other player in the game at this point in time. And if you carry that forward for at least five or five rounds or more, your economy will be greater than any other players in the game. And it'll essentially allow you to fund any composition you want successfully. Whether you want to play Legion, Faceless, you want to go to level 10 if you got a nice health pool, maybe you want to play Peasant Elf composition. It doesn't matter what you want to go for. You will be able to fund it and get it online because your economy will be that massive with Great Vault. And that by itself is the reason why it's in S tier. It's just so powerful and consistent and versatile, right? Because you can use it regardless of position at round 10. The only real downside to Great Vault is that you will take a bit of health damage in the short term as while everyone else is rolling, leveling, putting money into the composition, you'll be saving money. So just naturally, you'll probably lose a little more health than you would otherwise. And another small downside to this is that while you're saving money, everyone else will most likely be picking up units for really better compositions like Elves and Faceless, whereas you'll be saving your money. So I guess the downside here is that you'll essentially have last pick on what composition you want to put together as everyone else will be starting to form their compositions while you have not made any sort of moves as of yet. But that being said, actually, if you see someone going for a composition you want to play and they've only got a few units within it and you're stuck, you're up at 80 gold, great vault and fat economy, you can actually shove them out of the game and outroll them because you will 100% be generating more gold per turn than them and give you higher odds and more rolls at outrolling them for a specific composition. So even this downside of having last pick on what composition you want to play might not even be a downside in the end because your economy is so big that you can essentially shove them out of the game. So when I consider all the different factors around Great Vault, I can't help but feel as if it's literally the best relic to set you up for a top 1 position late game as the economy advantage you get from rounds 10 to 20 will be enough to outmuscle everyone else at the later parts of the game. So Great Vault STR number 1. Alright so next up so the next relic we're going to address is Vladimir's Offering. So the way Vladimir's works is that you steal 30% of the HP taken from the enemy when they lose to your board on their side of the field. And as a relic that you can choose at round 10, this relic is actually completely useless and is why I put it straight to the bottom tier, C tier, for round 10 relics, as it is completely useless in every situation at round 10. So Vladimir's itself 
isn't a great relic at all. The only real purpose you get from it is maybe if you pick it up at round 20, you're a mid-game spike in composition like Meepo Kira or 6 Elves and you're just looking to survive in the top 4 as opposed to winning the game. So essentially it's more like of a um, long-term elo game relic, right? It doesn't really help you win, it just helps you survive in the top 4, right? So just by nature it's a very average relic but that being said it can be picked sometimes, just never at round 10. So. Why never at round 10? Because it provides essentially no value regardless of if you're on the strongest side of the lobby or the opening side of the lobby, right? So let's say you're on the strongest side, you're probably already at 95% health. That means it's going to get you absolutely no value at all, maybe 5 health maximum. It doesn't help you generate economy, it doesn't help you snowball your position at all. Completely useless. And then think about it on the losing side. Yes, you might, have, you might be down to like 50% health and whatnot, but the problem is you're opening. You're already weaker than everyone else. You're not going to win rounds to benefit off this relic. So essentially, long story short, just never ever ever pick Vladimir's at round 10 because regardless of if you're winning or you're losing, it provides zero value, zero progress towards whatever compositions you're trying to put together. But it might work a little later in the game in certain situations, but for round 10, just skip it completely and move on. So. The next relic we're going to talk about is Mango Tree. So the way a Mango Tree works is that if the outcome on your board is different to the previous round, so i.e. if you lost last round and you won this round, you'll receive a Mango from your Mango Tree that provides a random amount of gold and XP from 1 to your current Korea level. So if you're level 6, the Mango can provide up to 6 gold and experience every time you click a Mango. So in my opinion, this relic goes straight to A tier, as even in the worst case scenario, you can still get up to 4 mangoes if you can't beat anyone else, i.e. if you lose round 11, win round 15, lose round 16, win round 20, which are all default outcomes. If you don't get those, you've lost the game already, but in those situations, you'd be getting 4 mangoes minimum, and those 4 mangoes will roughly net you 30 gold in value. And this is the worst outcome possible, and 30 gold I'd say is around average for our relic. So the fact that that's the minimum and you can go even higher, like double that, to me implies that it's a high quality relic that can provide you a lot of levels and gold to get your composition online quickly and put you ahead of other players. So the best way to play this relic is to essentially force wins and losses with priests. So ideally right at round 11, you'll take all your units off the board, put two priests in, lose that round, and then try and force your way to win round 12, lose round 13, etc, etc, etc. And if you pull off Mango Tree successfully, you should be able to get 8 mangoes max in total, which is an enormous amount of golden XP if you get good rolls and save them to around level 7 or higher. And like I said earlier, when Mango Tree is at its worst, so i.e. 4 mangoes, it still gets you an average amount of gold for any other relic you can play at this point in the game. So. The fact that it can only go higher indicates to me that it is actually a very good quality relic that is most likely going to put you ahead of other players if farmed efficiently. The main downside to play Mango Tree is that it can be very inconsistent to try and force wins and losses as one of the stronger players at round 10, as matching is random, you're not guaranteed to beat other players even if you think you've rolled enough. There's even a chance that all your mangoes just roll ones instead of any other valuable number, right? And it can also be quite taxing on your health by losing on purpose and then unfortunately losing again the next round as well if you're trying to force the strategy without priests. But if you're not on the bottom bottom end of the spectrum, this relic will most likely get you into a nice position compared to all the other players and can set you up very well for top 4 which is why I believe it's an A rank relic. So moving on to our next relic which is Shroud of Concealment. So the way Shroud works is that it provides a 25% chance to dodge damage if you lose a round on your board as well as hiding your board from enemy players so they'll be unable to see how your pieces are positioned. So when it comes to the tier list at round 10, I put Shroud right at the bottom of the tier list down at C tier as it essentially provides no economy and next to no value as a relic at round 10, whether you're on the strong side or the weak side of the lobby. 
So the only time that Shroud really is useful is super late game, like round 30 onwards where you're trying to maybe survive your way into top 4, your composition's already established so there's no need for extra economy or gold value generation. Or maybe if you're top 3 and you're trying to out position and play mind games with the last 2 opponents, but for round 10 it is completely useless as it provides no economy, does not help to put your composition together at all, and if you click this relic at round 10, you're going to fall behind everyone else by the time you reach round 20, and most likely slide into bottom 4, as every other player will most likely have some sort of relic to help them scale into mid and late game, while you'll be sitting there with a zero value relic, as even if you dodge as an opening player, it's only 25%, so there's a good chance it literally does nothing for you. So to keep things short on Shroud as it's useless at round 10, just skip it entirely if it's offered to you, and hope there's a better option available. So, the next relic we're going to move on to is Sin Reaper. So the way Sin Reaper works is that when you win a round on the enemy's board, you are provided with 3 experience towards your next level, and if you manage to steal a streak of someone else, XP will be provided at a rate of 2 times the length of the streak. So if they had a 9 win streak, you'll be provided with 18 experience instantly. And when I think about the relic as a whole in terms of how it's very situational, it can only work if you're on the stronger end of the lobby and have good RNG, in my opinion, it goes down to B tier. As most of the time it will only provide an average return, and only if you're super lucky will it set you ahead of other players. So the best way to play this relic is to ideally be on the stronger half of the lobby at round 10. So once round 11 starts and let's say you have to pick this relic, Sin Reaper, what you should do is you should go straight to level 6 if you're super confident in your lineup and just play what the game has given you so far. But maybe if you're in the middle ground, maybe there's 2-3 people stronger than you, Sin Reaper's one of your relics and you got like 2 trash relics like, I don't know, maybe Monopoly and Vladimir's are your other options, what you can do is try and force value out of your Sin Reaper by going straight to 6 and rolling your gold all the way down to 0 to try and get a stronger lineup than those placed ahead of you. So that way you can at least get something back from your relic and it might even set you up really well for top 4 if you're super lucky I can even steal a streak if 1st or 2nd place for instance did really well rounds 1 to 10 but then you rolled ahead of them. But again, this that type of rolling is definitely a bit of a gamble and you got to be really familiar with the game itself to understand if you're strong enough to play it or not, as it's possible you just roll all your money down and you still <laughs> lose every round, and now you're stuck at zero gold with a terrible economy and a valueless relic, and with a ticket straight to bottom four. But if you decide to open for rounds zero to ten, unfortunately this relic is completely useless as there's no way you'll be able to beat the players who didn't open unless you all in everything and roll all your money down and get super lucky but I highly recommend not doing that as it is way too risky to do so and you'll throw away that lose streak you've generated that's already netting you quite a good amount of gold. So with that being said, even if you do pull off Sin Reaper successfully, i.e. literally win every round against other players from round 10 to 20, it's only 27 gold worth of value if you translate XP to gold at a 1 to 1 ratio without stealing a streak. So as you can see it only really provides an average return most of the time, and the only time it really sets itself apart from other relics is if you steal a big streak of someone else, which is very RNG reliant and hard to pull off consistently as not only do you have to roll and be stronger than a streaking player which is already difficult in itself, you also have to be matched against them, and you have to win, and you have to hope that no one else steals that streak before you. So most of the time, Sin Reaper is only going to give you an average to a below average gold return when compared to other relics, so in my opinion it's not a fantastic relic, and it really should only be picked if you're super powerful and there are streaks on the horizon that you can possibly steal, as stealing a streak will literally double, triple, even quadruple the value of this relic. So very high risk, high reward type of relic this one, take it with caution. And of course the biggest downside to this relic is that a lot of the time it might just be completely useless, especially if you're opening and you're not comfortable with trying to quick level and quick roll to beat stronger players. So all in all I think it deserves a spot in B tier as 
it can provide some return has potential to set you up for top one, but most of the time you'll get a mediocre to below average output as it's hard to force wins. As past round 15, compositions like 6 elf might come online, so if you can't beat those people, you get even less value from your relic. So all in all, unless you're super strong and you're confident that you can steal streaks from the players above you, I don't recommend taking this relic as it is unlikely to set you apart from the other players. So moving on to our next relic, we're going to move on to Monopoly Contract. So the way Monopoly Contract works is that when you 3 star a unit on your board, you'll be provided with a gold reward corresponding to the level of the unit 3 starred and how many of that unit is used on any other enemy board. So if there are more of that piece on other people's boards, you'll get more gold from your reward. And on top of this, it will remove the selected piece from the game. So if I, let's say, 3 star a Legion Commander with Monopoly Contract, it will remove that unit completely out of the game and no other player will be able to access it. So as a round 10 relic, I put Monopoly Contract straight to C tier as it is way too early to be able to 3 star units outside of Druids consistently and will most of the time just get you next to no value, whether you're on the strong side of the lobby or the weak side, as the pacing to get 3 star units is generally always past round 20, not before. So by clicking this before, you'll probably only maybe get 5 to 10 gold if you're super lucky, and outside of that, most likely zero. So overall, very useless for round 10. The only times you should really be picking up Monopoly and using it is at rounds 20 and 30, much later into the game, when your composition is more developed and you're much closer, or maybe you've even hit the 3 star units already and are looking for instant gold rewards to push your composition slightly harder into top 4 position. Or if you're super super lucky, what you can do is try and sneak a monopoly over someone contesting the same composition as you thereby forcibly removing them from the game. So let's say you're both competing for Shadow Fiend 3 Maybe you hit Shadow Fiend 3, he's only got a Shadow Fiend 2. Hit the Monopoly contract, all of a sudden he can't get any more Shadow Fiends, he's done. He has to leave the game because he can't get his composition online anymore and is already invested into it. So that being said, the only time you should really pick Monopoly is if you're going for a re-roll composition, you're close to 3 stars or have 3 stars and it's much later in the game but unfortunately round 10 is a terrible time to pick up monopoly straight to c tier just skip it for round 10 as it will do nothing except set you behind everyone else who picked up a relic that generated them some sort of economic value all right so moving on to our next relic chioscuro so the way this one works is that your win and loss streak income is doubled per round and when you lose your win or loss streak you'll be rewarded a gold reward based on how long that streak was. So if you had a winning streak of 8, then you lost a round, Chiascara would provide you with 8 gold on the rounds you lost. So in my opinion, Chiascara only really belongs in B tier, as it's a very situational relic which only really gives any sort of value if you're hard win streaking or hard lose streaking. And even in the situations it can work like those two, it doesn't really provide that amazing of a gold return it's usually closer to average so i think b tier is a solid place to place this relic as it can provide returns but most of the time it's below average doesn't really do anything special so but let's say it's the only valuable relic offered to you let's say you're win streaking the best play here is to go straight to level 6 at round 11 to ensure you're strong enough to maintain that streak for as long as possible and if after scouting the other opponents in the top half of your lobby as well, and you might, maybe you feel they're a bit stronger than you, don't hesitate to roll down your money just a little bit, just to hopefully strengthen your composition a bit more so you can get as much value out of your Chiascara Relic as possible. But a neat little trick you can do is if you're trying to go for like say a level 10 late game composition, what you can do is if you've managed to streak all the way to round 19, what you should actually do there is lose that round on purpose so you can get the gold reward just as the relic is about to expire. Because if you're going for level 10 late game compositions, past round 10, uh, 20, you're pretty much guaranteed to lose those rounds as other players playing mid-game compositions like Assassins, Hunters, Elves are going to start coming online, so you might as well lose now 
and get as much value out of it as possible, as opposed to keeping it past round 20, where you get no gold reward back. But let's say um, it's round 10, you've lost streaks from round 0 to 10. The best play here is to continue to lose streak with priests, ideally to round 15. But from round 16 onwards, you really can't afford to keep losing from that point onwards, as your health will get way too low. For, for instance, being below 30% health at round 16 is probably a bit too risky to get into top 4. So yes, you can get a bit of value from the lost streak side, but it doesn't usually end up being too much, like maybe you'll get 8, 9 gold from the streak end reward, and maybe you'll get, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 or so gold from the streak income, but overall, as you can see, it does, it's not a fantastic return compared to what else you could be running instead. So just for example's sake, right, uh, the max return you can get from your streaks with Chiaroscuro is 3 gold a turn for streaks greater than 9, which is super unlikely in the first place. And then you compare it to Great Vault, someone who's sitting on 80 gold is generating an extra 8 gold a turn compared to your three situational 3 gold, right? Just comparing those two kind of puts it into perspective of how little impact Chiaroscuro does compared to Great Vault, for instance, right? And not only this, we haven't even considered the fact that Chiaroscuro does suffer from variance and RNG from round to round to ruin its return, as streaks are dependent on fixed outcomes that you need every single time. But unfortunately in Dota Chess, there is a bit of RNG here and there, and the unexpected can happen quite frequently, so maybe you're trying to lose streak, it's round 11, uh oh, you're fighting another priest player, you accidentally win the round, Chiaroscuro is done, it's over. You get no more gold value from your relic, right? Or on the other side, you're win streaking, and unfortunately you have a unlucky fight on your board, you lose your streak, and all of a sudden, the relic's dead. Again, so the problem with Chiaroscuro is that it provides an average return, and at the same time, it can be quite volatile and risky to run, as it's quite easy to lose your streak just to a bit of bad RNG. So all in all for Chiaroscuro, I could say it's it's about an average relic in terms of gathering gold, where even in ideal situations, it's not fantastic. It might be a bit above average, but it's nothing special is what I'm trying to say. And the issue is that most other players will probably pick a relic with greater value than yours. So overall, Chiaroscuro is kind of a relic you only pick very situationally. And most of the time, it won't set you up or put you ahead of other players. So B tier is where Chiaroscuro belongs. So moving on to our next relic, Second Chance. So the way Second Chance works is that when you use a consumable like a human book, Tango, even a Jelly Shield, you have a 33% chance to refund it back into your inventory. So when it comes to placing Second Chance in the tier list, I personally believe it belongs into B tier as well due to the high variance on its return with the 33% chance to refund, which is pretty low honestly. And the issue is that at round 10, second chance is very situational and doesn't work in a lot of situations there. The only time second chance is really useful at round 10 is if in your position where you're not opening and you're planning on playing priests and humans from rounds 10 to 20 to set up for a level 10 late game composition as you're farming as many different types of consumables as possible in the form of human books and priest rewards. That's the best way to get return from second chance. And a neat little trick you can do is if you opt for second chance at round 10, is to actually hold the relic and not click it until you're past round 20. As what this will do is it'll allow that second chance to actually last all the way to round 30 and allow you to stockpile more consumables and get a little extra value out of that second chance relic. But usually you won't get all the way to round 30, maybe you'll go to around round 25 and what you can even do on top of that is with the relic box you get at round 20, you can also peek it while having your second chance from round 10 relic active and decide what your actions are going to be from that point forward. So even if you use second chance in this most ideal scenario which I just explained, the return on second chance again is extremely volatile by nature as what? 33% chance the refund isn't high in the first place, and there's a good chance you might even end up with next to zero multicast, and as a result, next to no value from your relic, and well, if that happens, you're probably going to go straight to bottom four. But 
On the other hand, with second chance, it could also be the greatest relic ever, where there are times where you can go straight to level 10 at round 21, the moment you click the relic in, if you're super, super, super lucky. So as you can see, it could be absolute trash, top 8, or a Bezier put you straight into top 1 position by getting you to level 10 extremely, extremely fast. So when it comes to second chance, I believe it's a bit of a B tier relic as it's very, very situational, extremely high risk, high reward, as it could set you at top 1 or top 8. It can, it can go either way. So yes, use this relic with caution, B tier, situational, yeah. That's really it for second chance. So on to our next relic, the IO relic. So the way the IO relic works is that it gives you a five times chance of finding IOs in your shop when selected. So in my opinion, this relic's a bit of a hard C tier in my opinion because extremely high variance relic. And honestly, five times zero is zero, let's be real. And there's a good chance from around 10 to 20, you just see zero IOs regardless, leading to pretty much useless relic. So when it comes to using this IO relic, there's no specific strategy in terms of utilizing it to its max potential, except for really just rolling for your units and hoping an IO appears out of the blue. But except from that, there's not really much to it. And the issue with the IO relic is that it doesn't actually generate any gold to help you fund your pieces. And collecting multiple IOs if you're on the lucky side of the spectrum to build units is extremely expensive as you'll essentially be paying premiums on what would be the base cost of your units. So on that end, you're actually making your build more expensive sometimes. Especially if you're mainly going for one and two cost units, IO really isn't that cost efficient. And the only time I'd really ever used IO Relic is probably past round 30 where most of your compositions already been established and what you're trying to do is find an IO to complete some two star legendaries here and there to completely round off a late game composition. But for rounds 10 and 20, I would probably step away from this relic, just leave it to the side. It's definitely a late game relic for luxury purposes. The only real upside I can see to this relic is maybe if you find a lot of IOs for maybe 3 and 4 cost units, maybe you'll save yourself a bit of money in the long run on roll since you won't have to find specific units, you can just find IOs instead. But with the same issue out, I outlined earlier, you're going to be paying premium at 5 gold, as IOs are quite expensive. So when it comes to round 10 IO Relic, it doesn't really set you up for a success into top 4, it doesn't really contribute to your economy that well, it doesn't really set you ahead of other players in particular, as it just makes your composition more expensive or does nothing at all. So in my opinion, it goes bottom C tier, but hey, at least it's not as bad as Vladim is offering. Okay, so moving on to the next relic, which is one of the newest ones right now, which is the Shrink Ray. So, the way Shrink Ray works is that when you're rolling, you have a 60% chance to have it cost 1 gold instead of 2 gold for your roll. And when that triggers, you'll recruit from a table probability as if you are 2 levels below what your courier is currently leveled. So if you're level 5, Shrink Ray procs on one of your rolls, your shot rolls would be as if you were at level 3 instead. And in my opinion, this is actually probably one of the best relics you can get right now at round 10, as it's useful in most situations whether you're opening or you're win streaking, and it is extremely efficient at putting together specific compositions and getting it online before anyone else gets their composition online. And for those reasons, I believe it belongs in A tier. So the best way to use this relic is to essentially just stop leveling completely and just immediately dismiss a synergy once you pass 40 gold, and spend all of your money on rolling to make maximum use of this relic. The great thing about this relic is that it saves you money on rolls on that 60% chance trigger and gives insanely good odds for those 1 and 2 cost units which is what Shrink Ray specialises in fishing for. So compositions that would really benefit off this relic are things like 1 and 2 cost Poverty Faceless, Elves, Hunters and even Reroll Knights. Essentially anything that predominantly has 1 and 2 cost units are what make this relic shine the most. So to put this into perspective, with this relic at round 10, and let's say you're trying to go for, I don't know, a 1 and 2 cost faceless build, you can actually expect to have multiple 3 star units before round 20, allowing you to hit a mid game power spike extremely quickly and allow you to win streak through that period of time and allow you to essentially survive into top 4 with those early mid game compositions consistently. But the downside to this relic is that the compositions that really shine off this sort of gameplay 
really do scale off late game and will really really struggle to top one. But the upside is, is that it's extremely extremely effective at power spiking and hitting top 4 consistently. So over the long run, you'll definitely grind out and gain a lot more elo if you make use of this Shrink Ray Relic. Which is why I believe Shrink Ray has a good spot in the A tier. Alright, so moving on to our next relic, which is Elite Recruiter. So the way Elite Recruiter works is that your shop rolls will recruit from a probability table as if your courier was one level higher. So for round 10, Elite Recruit is really not that useful at this stage of the game as it doesn't really generate any economy to help with levels or rolling for 3 stars, so in my opinion it goes straight to C tier for round 10. The only time you might get some value from this relic is if you're the one of the stronger players in the lobby and you're looking to just pump levels and get to straight to level 10 as soon as possible. So on your way there, you'll get slightly higher quality rolls when you hit level 6 and 7, and you'll have slightly better odds at hitting those really impactful 4 cost units like Chen and Keeper of the Light. But at this point, you're still better off picking any other relic, like even Sin Reaper probably outdoes it here if you're win streaking, as it contributes to levels and actually establishing yourself late game much more efficiently over Elite Recruiter. And outside of this really specific situation, the relic is completely useless, especially if you're opening and you're trying to go for a mid-game composition, as you want to be a lower level in a lot of these cases, so Elite Recruiter actually does more harm than good in these scenarios. So essentially, Elite Recruiter really isn't that useful at round 10, doesn't really contribute to your economy or position in the game, but when it comes to round 20, Elite Recruiter is actually amazing in a lot of situations, like I'm talking 10 times better, especially if you're looking to level and play a late game composition, maybe you're around level 8 or 9 at round 20. It'll allow you to fish for those legendary pieces quicker than anyone else in the lobby and give you that one up over anyone else who's trying to scale with you. But for now we're talking about round 10 and the tier list at that point in time, so for now round 10 Elite Recruiter C tier, very useless, but from round 20 onwards is a different story. But for now at round 10, just completely skip this relic entirely as it will do nothing for your position at all. Alright, so onto the next relic which is Dark Gear. So when you win a round on your board, you will receive a Dark Heart of the Machine which when activated provides you a full roll of units that are not in the current unit pool right now. So things like Bloodseeker, Phantom Assassin, Lich, Sven, you know, all those units that aren't in the pool right now. So when it came to placing Dark Gear in the tier list, I was really split between putting in A tier or B tier. But in the end, I decided to put it into low A, as even though it's very, very situational and can only be used if you're one of the stronger players in the lobby at round 10 slash 11, and is useless if you're opening and lose streaking, but if you utilize it properly, you can actually snowball into a really hard win streak and set up for a top 1 position with good rolls from those dark hearts of the machines. So it has an enormous or has potential to have an enormous impact, but it's situational. So I placed it into low A for now. So if you do decide to pick up Dark Gear with a moderately strong composition at round 10, what you should look to do at round 11 is to go straight to level 6 and put together a composition as strong as possible as you need to farm wins to get use from this relic. And after hitting level 6, if you're still uncertain about your lineup, don't be afraid to roll down a little further to try and strengthen your composition a little more as it's just a top priority to make sure you guarantee these wins from rounds 10 to 20. And the moment you start winning rounds and getting Dark Heart of the Machines into your inventory, don't hesitate to click them immediately if you need a bit more strength in your lineup and look for units like 2 star Bloodseeker, 2 star Omni Knight, Phantom Assassins and Dragon Knights and look to play 2 Akia or 6 Undead depending on what you receive as both of these compositions benefit quite well off the pool of units that you can get from the Dark Heart of the Machines. So as a general guideline, if you get a lot of Omni Knights and Dragon Knights, what you can do is you can opt for more of a 6 Undead composition, with Dragon Knight being the hyper carry in a 6 Undead composition, benefiting off Dragons with Visage and Winter Wyvern as, the, as two other Undead units, and Omni Knight 3 
would serve as a nice front line for that composition. But if you get like an abundance of Phantom Assassins or Omni Knights and even get more past the 3 star level, you can actually look to play a 2 Akira composition using those extra pieces past 3 star as your frontline seeds, which will actually snowball very heavily into late game and scales quite well, as it will let you level quite comfortably as you'll essentially be beating everyone else and doing an enormous amount of damage as Akira in general tends to do like 20 or so damage a turn. So it's definitely a more complicated style of play as you have to immediately react to what you receive from your Dark Hearts of the Machine and then formulate a composition on the fly. But it's definitely worth practicing this style of gameplay as there are there will be some situations where Dark Gear is the best relic for you and you will be able to snowball this into a top 1 position if you know how to play it correctly. So what makes this relic so strong is that the 2 star units from Dark Heart that you can get like Bloodseeker and Omni Knight are really really powerful from rounds 10 to 20 and can almost guarantee wins for your board over any other enemies on the field right now. And not only this, but by round 20 with those hearts of the machines if you farm them efficiently, you actually have a really really good chance at 3 starring those units. And if you manage to 3 star these units before round 20, you're extremely, extremely far ahead of anyone else and can even win streak into round 25 onwards. And that's not even mentioning how it can enable very, very powerful mid-game synergies like for Orc. And with those synergies, it will allow you to essentially plow everyone else and gain a nice advantage over others through unit quality with three stars from your Dark Hearts of the Machines, as well as an economic advantage in gold as well if you manage to win streak with this relic successfully. But the big big downside to this relic is that it only really works when you're on the strongest side of the lobby and if you're opening with Priest from round 0 to 10 and you get offered this relic, it's essentially worthless as you won't be able to put yourself into a position to win streak from complete open at round 11. And another downside is that maybe you might be a bit too overconfident in your lineup at round 11 and you lose a few too many rounds from round 0 to 10 and if you don't get enough dark cards you won't be able to hit 3 star units at which point your dark gear is almost going to be a useless relic as the 2 star units you get mid game from this heart of the machine isn't quite enough to win you a game. But the 3 stars on the other hand are definitely powerful enough to plow you through the mid game into a top 1 or 2 position late game. So all things considered for dark heart while it is very situational in that you can only really play it as a stronger player in the lobby at round 10 and 11, it has insane potential to make you win streak the whole of mid game and even scale really well into late game with proper roles like hitting Omni 3, hitting PA 3, hitting a Dragon Knight 2. So when played successfully it has top 2 potential but it's let down by the fact that it's so situational in that you have to be a stronger player and if you open it's completely worthless. So in conclusion, I think it fits well into a low A tier. Alright, on to the last relic and that is Weaponsmith. So the way Weaponsmith works is that when you receive items from chests or monster drops, each item has a 75% chance to be increased in quality by one tier. So when it comes to placing Weaponsmith in the tier list, I believe it fits quite well into B tier as it's quite RNG reliant to get a really good return from this relic as it's RNG reliant to improve the quality of the item and then once it's improved it's randomly chosen from its tier so it won't necessarily be a item useful to your composition but the upside is that regardless of what position you're in whether you're win streaking or lose streaking you will almost be guaranteed some sort of value from the relic as all compositions do benefit off items but the problem is that in the current meta what gets prioritized are the quality of your units and what level you are not so much on the items right now as it was in the past so because of that it's not completely useless but at the same time it's not great so i think it fits in the middle at b tier as a okay relic so the best way to use weaponsmith at round 10 is to ideally have saved your boxes from rounds 1, 2 and 3 and not open it until your weaponsmith has been popped for maximum value where you can essentially increase the quality of as many items as possible. But the issue is that with weaponsmith it really only shines and gives amazing results 
when it works with a few specific compositions that are physical damage oriented such as assassins and knights, as most tier 1 items that are being promoted from tier 0 are things like hammer, javelin, broadsword, you know, things that really benefit off physical hyper carries. So yes, in those scenarios where you go those types of compositions, it can be a really nice pickup. But the problem with going this route and style of gameplay where you save your items is that essentially you're foregoing opening the boxes from rounds 1 to 10 and possibly foregoing rounds you could have won and possibly saved a bit of extra health to help you survive late game. But if you opted to open with Priest, I guess it's not too bad of a play given you're going to lose them anyway, you might as well save your boxes for Weaponsmith. RNG. So in the situations where it does work with your physical damage based compositions, it can actually provide really really insane items and put you ahead of other players. Like it does have that potential as a classic item you can hit at round 15 once you've finished it is things like Mjolnir, Reva, Sacred Relic. But again these are quite RNG reliant chops. But if you hit these, it can actually set you up quite nicely for top 4 as if let's say you're playing Knights, you got a Luna 3 and you slap a Desolator on it. At round 16, you're probably going to be guaranteed a win streak and it will actually put you ahead of other players if you're super super lucky. But the downside to this relic is that if you don't quite get the items you want, the problem with Weaponsmith is that compared to other relics, you will most likely fall behind on levels and unit quality as Weaponsmith doesn't really generate any sort of gold value, all it does is really improve your items. So on that end of the spectrum, you can expect to fall behind other players if you're Item drops are really not up to standard, as everyone else will have a much stronger economy than you. So outside of the chance of being super lucky with your drops, Weaponsmith doesn't really impact your position that well, especially if you don't have a physical damage based composition. And overall, I wouldn't really say it guarantees bottom 4 or top 4, just overall has an average impact on your position in general. And as a result, in conclusion, I think it just it fits nice and well into B tier as it doesn't quite build you an economy like everyone else, but it has potential to cover that gap with really nice item drops. And so, there we have it. The long overdue relic guide and tier list for round 10, done and dusted. I've also compiled all the relics into a simple tier list for your use as a quick reference sheet, as you can see right now on the video, and we'll have a link below for you to download. So yeah, I hope you all enjoyed my video and thoughts on all the relics Auto Chess has to offer as it took me far too long to put this together but hey, we made it in the end. As always, make sure to like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel to be notified of when I post a new video and check me out on Twitch over at twitch.tv slash crackattack underscore 420 to catch me live from Monday to Saturday at 7pm Australian Eastern Standard Time. Anyways, see you all next time. Peace.